What's up guys, welcome back. Today we are going over chapter three in Maxwell Maltz Psycho-Cybernetics. This one, this chapter is called Imagination, the first key to your success mechanism. So let's get into it. Imagination plays a far more important role in our lives than most of us realize. I've seen this demonstrated many times in my practice. A particularly memorable instance of this fact concerned a patient, patient who was literally forced to visit my office by his family. He was a man of about 40, unmarried, who held down a routine job during the day and kept himself in his room when the workday was over, never going anywhere, never doing anything. He had many jobs and never seemed to be able to stay with any of them for a great length of time. His problem was that he had a rather large nose and ears which protruded a little more than normal. He considered himself ugly and funny looking. He imagined that the people he came into contact with during the day were laughing at him and talking about him behind his back because he was so odd. His imaginings grew so strong that he actually feared going out into the business world and moving among people. The poor man even imagined that his family was ashamed of him because he was peculiar looking, not like other people. Actually, his facial deficiencies were not serious. His nose was of the classical Roman type, and his ears, though somewhat large, attracted no more attention than those thousands of people with similar ears. In desperation, his family brought him to me to see if I could help him. I saw that he did not need surgery, only an understanding of the fact that his imagination had wrought such havoc with his self-image that he had lost sight of the truth. He was not really ugly. People did not consider him odd and laugh at him because of his appearance. His imagination alone was responsible for his misery. And this is so true. For so, so often, we as human beings are caught up in worry, anxiety, fear of something that isn't even there. They have that acronym for fear, which is false evidence appearing real. And many times, a lot of the monsters under the bed or what have you are of our own creation. Um, his imagination had set up an automatic negative failure mechanism within him, and it was operating full blast to ex his extreme misfortune. Fortunately, after several sessions with him and with the help of his family, he was able to gradually realize that the power of his own imagination was responsible for his plight, and he succeeded to in building up a true self-image and achieving the confidence he needed by applying creative imagination rather than destructive imagination. Creative imagination, see, and every time that we speak badly of ourselves, that we condemn other people, we are using a uh, destructive imagination. And there's science now that shows that when we, when we do that, and when we entertain those negative thoughts, feeling states, emotions, we're wreaking havoc actually on our own bodies at a cellular level. You know, everything is made of energy. And so that is the power of thought. That is the power that Maxwell Maltz is talking about here. Creative imagination is not something reserved for the poets, the philosophers, the inventors. It enters into our every act. For imagination sets the goal picture, which our automatic mechanism works on. We act or fail to act, not because of will, as so commonly believed, but because of imagination. And it's interesting because Emil Coué talks about when the will and the imagination are in opposition, the imagination invariably wins. And they, they've they used examples where it's like you walk on a plank. If, you, if the plank is resting on the ground, you have no, no uh, it's easy for you to walk straight on the plank. But if you put that plank suspended two, three stories in the air, you notice that people begin to wobble. People get, begin to falter in their step. Even if you take away wind conditions, all of that, it's like the imagination, imagining the, the possibility of falling is what causes you to falter and lose your step. And anytime that the will is engaged with one thing, you say you want this, you want this, right? But you keep imagining that negative relationship. You keep imagining that negative outcome. The imagination wins out in that battle. That is why the will and the imagination have to be in alignment. And that's what Maxwell Maltz is getting into here. A human being always acts and feels and performs in accordance with what he imagines to be true about himself and his environment. And this is exactly it, guys. This is why I talk about the self-concept and your belief about yourself in relation to your environment is what is governing your results. That is the filter through which you are perceiving reality. 
This is a basic and fundamental law of mind. It is the way we are built. When we see this law of mind graphically and dramatically demonstrated in a hypnotized subject, we are prone to think that there is something occult or supernormal at work. Actually, what we are witnessing is the normal operating processes of the human brain and nervous system. For example, if a good hypnotic subject is told that he is at the North Pole, he will not only shiver and appear to be cold, his body will react just as if he were cold and goose pimples will develop. The same phenomenon has been demonstrated on a wide wake uh, college students by asking them to imagine that one hand is immersed in ice water. Thermometer readings show that the temperature does drop in the trust treated hand. Tell a hypnotized subject that your finger is a red hot poker and he will not only grimace with pain at your touch, but his cardiovascular and lymphatic systems will react just as if your finger were a red hot poker and produce inflammation and perhaps a blister on the skin. When college students wide awake have been told to imagine that a spot in their foreheads were hot, temperature readings have shown an actual increase in skin temperature. Your nervous system cannot tell the difference between an imagined experience and a quote real experience. In either case, it reacts automatically to information which you have given it to from your forebrain. Your nervous system reacts appropriately to what you think or imagine to be true. <laughs> and this is so, uh, it's so true. I mean, you can observe this everywhere, but that's why getting it at our beliefs, becoming aware of the inner conversations, what, what story we're entertaining, what we're telling ourselves is so vastly, vitally important. If you go around thinking that um, there's no opportunity and the the rich are evil or that um you know i don't know that those are maybe like silly examples but they're not really because that type of pervasive attitude of eat the rich and this like certain things you can see that it just takes over it takes root especially when it's repeated over and over and over again you can see how in our society certain things get repeated vladimir lenin has a quote about that that if you repeat something many, uh, enough times whether it's a lie or true even if it's a lie people will start to believe it so the secret of hypnotic power. Dr. Theodore Xenophon Barber has conducted extensive research into the phenomena of hypnosis, both when he was associated with the psychology department of the American University in Washington, and also after becoming associated with the social relations at Harvard. Writing in Science Digest, he said, we found that hypnotic subjects are able to do surprising things only when convinced that the hypnotist's word, words are true statements. When the hypnotist has guided the subject to the point where he is convinced that they are true statements, the subject then behaves differently because he thinks and believes differently. The phenomena of hypnosis have always been seemed to be mysterious because it has always been difficult to understand how belief can bring about such unusual behavior. It always seemed as if there must be something more, some unfathomable force or power at work. However, the plain truth is that when a subject is convicted, convinced that he is deaf, he behaves as if he is deaf. When he is convinced that he is insensitive to pain, he can go uh, undergo surgery without anesthesia. The mysterious force or power does not, <laughs> does not exist. Could you be hypnotized? So that's a quote from a book, I guess. A little, or the science digest, digest. A little reflection will show why it is a very good thing for us that we do feel and act according to what we believe or imagine to be true. Truth determines action and behavior. The human brain and nervous system are engineered to react automatically and appropriately to the problems and challenges in the environment. For example, a man does not need to stop and think that self-survival requires that he run if he meets a grizzly bear on a trail. He does not need to decide to become afraid. The fear response is both automatic and appropriate. First, it makes him want to flee. The fear then triggers his bodily mechanisms, which soup up his muscles so that he can run faster than he has before. His heartbeat quickens, adrenaline, a powerful muscle stimulant is poured into the bloodstream. All bodily functions are not necessary to running are shut down. The stomach stops working and all available blood is sent to his muscles. Breathing is much faster and oxygen supplies the muscles to be increased manifold. All this is, of course, nothing new. Most of us learned it in high school. What we have not been so quick to realize, however, is the brain and nervous system which reacts automatically to environment is the same brain and nervous system which tells us what the environment is. The reactions of the man meeting of the bear are commonly thought of as due to emotion rather than ideas. Yet it was an idea, information received from the outside, the outside world and evaluated by the forebrain, which sparked the so-called emotional reaction. 
Thus, it was basically idea or belief, which was tr a true causative agent rather than emotion, which came as a result. In short, the man on the trail reacted to what he thought or believed or imagined the environment to be. The messages brought to him from the environment consist of nerve impulses from the various sense organs. These nerve impulses are decoded, interpreted, and evaluated in the brain and made known to us in the form of ideas or mental images. In the final analysis, it is these mental images that we react to. You act and feel not according to what things are really like, but according to the image your mind holds of what they are like. You have certain mental images of yourself, your world, and the people around you, and you behave as though these images were the truth, the reality, rather than the things they represent. Let us suppose, for example, that the man on the trail had not met a real bear, but a movie director dressed in a bear costume. If he thought and imagined the actor to be a bear, his emotional and nervous system reactions would have been exactly the same. Or let us suppose he met a large shaggy dog, which his fear-ridden imagination mistook for a bear. Again, he would react automatically to what he believed to be true concerning himself and his environment. It follows that if our ideas and mental images concerning ourselves are distorted or unrealistic, then our reaction to our environment will be likewise inappropriate. And that is the, the issue that we have, is that many of our ideas and mental images of ourselves and our, our environment are distorted and unrealistic. And many times it is in the negative way that they are distorted. These primal fight or flight mechanisms are at work and they're at work in our modern day. It's like we can't turn them off because we don't, we don't run into these bears in the woods. We don't run into these natural threats that our ancestors ran into. And so they come in the form of thoughts. They come in the form of posts. They come in the form of interactions with other people, even though they're not life-threatening interactions. We, our body perceives them as a threat and we are constantly in this state. And that's why we're not able to engage in conscious decision-making because all of our blood, like he mentions, goes into our survival-based, the most primitive thing to make our muscles run, uh, pump blood faster or get our heart rate going faster. And that's causing all kinds of stress and degradation in our, in our body at a cel cellular level. Why not imagine yourself successful? Realizing that our actions, feelings, and behavior are the result of our own images and beliefs gives us the lever that psychology has always needed for changing personality. It opens a new psychologic door to gaining skill, success, and happiness. Mental pictures offer us an opportunity to practice new traits and attitudes, which otherwise we could not do. This is possible because, again, your nervous system cannot tell the difference between an actual experience and one that is vividly imagined. If we picture ourselves performing in a certain manner, it is nearly the same as actual performance. Mental practice helps to make it perfect. He's going to go now into these examples in um, different sports and athletics and all the best athletes in today's day and age, Michael Phelps, Kobe Bryant, the people at the top of their at the top of the the top of the ladder in terms of athletics they all practice sports visualization there's even a whole um industry that's based on this so in a controlled experiment psychologist ra vandell proved that mental practice and throwing darts at a target whether the person sits for a period each day in front of the target and imagines throwing darts at it improves aim as much as actually throwing darts Research Quarterly reports and experiments on the effect of mental practice on improving skill in sinking basketball free throws. One group of students actually practiced throwing the ball every day for 20 days and were scored on the first and last days. The second group was scored on the first and last days and engaged in no sort of practice in between. A third group was scored on the first day, then spent 20 minutes a day imagining they were throwing the ball at the goal. When they missed, they would imagine that they were corrected their aim accordingly. The first group which actually practiced 20 minutes a day, <clears throat> improved in scoring 24%. The second group, which had no sort of practice, showed no improvement. And the third group, which practiced in their imagination, improved in scoring 23%. So it's about the same improvement as the one that actually practiced. How Imagination Practice won a chess championship. In April 1955, issue of the Reader's Digest contained an article from the Rotarian by Joseph Phillips called Chess. They call it a game. In the article, Phillips tells how the great chess champions, Capablanca, was so superior to all competition that it was believed by experts that he would never be beaten in match play. Yet he lost the championship to a rather obscure player, Alekhine, 
who had given no hint that he even posed a serious threat to the great Capablanca. The chess world was stunned by the upset, which today would be comparable to a Golden Gloves finalist defeating a heavyweight champion of the world. Phillips tells us that Alkine had trained for the match very much like a boxer, conditioning himself for, the fight, for a fight. He retired to the country, cut out smoking and drinking, and did calisthenics. For three months, he played chess only in his mind, building up steam for the moment when he would meet the champion. That's wild. Mental pictures can help you sell more goods. In, this, in his book, How to Make $25,000 a Year Selling, Charles B. Roth tells how a group of salesmen in Detroit who tried a new idea increased their sales 100%. Another group in New York increased by 150%. And individual salesmen using the same ideas had increased their sales up to 400%. And what is the magic that accomplishes so much for salesmen? It is something called role-playing. And you should know about it. We did this. We, when I was doing sales, I did a lot of role playing and it improved my sales unbelievably. You should know about it because if you will let it, it may help you double your sales. What is role playing? Well, it's simply imagining yourself in various sales situations and then solving them in your mind until you know what to say and what to do and the situation comes up in real life. It is what is called on the football field, skull practice. The reason why it accomplishes so much is that selling or is simply a matter of situations. One is created every time you talk to a customer. He says something or asks a question or raises an objection. If you always know how to counter what he says or answer his question or handle an objection, you make sales. A role-playing salesman at night when he is alone will create these situations. He will imagine the prospect throwing the wildest kinds of curves at him. He will then work out the best answer to them. No matter what the situation is, you can compare, prepare for it beforehand by a means of imagining yourself and your prospect face-to-face -face when he's raising objections and creating problems, you are handling them properly. When I did this, we would use, I, I, I did it with my mentor and I would go over what the, com, what the objections were that I ran into that day. And then he would tell me the way that he usually handles them. And then I would go in and handle the objection in the way that he would. And then I would, the next day I would go and I would have, because a lot of these objections were common objections. And so I would have those responses then ready because I had practiced them and I would then get that much farther in the process, especially when I was learning. But then eventually I would begin to start making sales that way. And like they said, um, you know, I, I became a very, as a rookie, I was like the number one rookie in my region. And this was a big part of it was doing these role plays. I also used affirming, plenty of affirming, robotic affirming while I was on my uh, walks throughout the day, but the aspect of actually using this mental rehearsal was hugely impactful in my performance. The late William Moulton Marston, well-known psychologist, recommended what he called rehearsal practice to men and women who came to him looking for job advancement. If you have an important interview coming up, such as make an application for a job, his advice was plan for the interview in advance. Go over in your mind all the various questions that you were likely to be asked. Think about the answers you are going to give, then rehearse the interview in your mind. Even if none of the questions you rehearsed come up, the rehearsal practice will still work wonders. It gives you confidence, and even though real life has not set lines to be recited like a stage play, rehearsal practice will help you ad-lib and react spontaneously to whatever situation you find yourself in because you have practiced reacting spontaneously. Don't be a ham actor, Dr. Marston would say, explaining that we are always acting out some role in life. It's what we've been talking about lately, guys, is that we're always playing a role. We're always playing a character and embodying a state, as Neville would say, or a archetype of consciousness. And these archetypes already exist. So it's a simple matter of switching into that state, switching into that viewpoint. Simple, maybe not easy, but it is simple. Why not select the right role, the role of a successful person and rehearse it? And this is what Vadim Zeeland in Tufti talks about and is as modeling the imitation game, they call it in Tufti the Priestess. It's an excellent book that goes into these ideas as well. Um, actually, really, really great book. It's probably, it's up there along with this one is my top, top books. Writing in Your Life magazine, Dr. Marson said, frequently, the next step in your career cannot be taken without first gaining some experience in the work you'll be ca called upon to perform. Bluff may open the door to a job you know nothing about, but in nine cases out of 10, it won't help you from being fired when your inexperience becomes evident. 
There's only one way I know to project your practical knowledge beyond your present occupation, and that is rehearsal planning. Concert pianist practices in his head. Arthur Schnabel, the world's world famous concert pianist, took lessons for only seven years. He hated practice and seldom does practice for any length of time in an actual piano keyboard. When questioned about his small amount of practice as compared with other pianists, he said, I practice in my head. C.G. Kopp of Holland, a recognized authority on teaching piano, recommends that all pianists practice in their heads. A new composition, he says, should be first gone over in the mind. It should be memorized and played in the mind before ever touching fingers to the keyboard. Imagine pra imagination practice can lower your golf score. Time Magazine reported that when Ben Hogan is playing in a tournament, he mentally rehearses each shot just before making it. He makes the shot perfectly in his imagination, feels the club head strike the ball just as it should, feels himself performing the perfect follow through, and then steps up to the ball, and depends upon what he calls muscle memory to carry out the shot just as he imagined it. Alex Morrison, perhaps the most well-known golf teacher in the world, has actually worked out a system of mental practice that enables you to improve your golf score by sitting in an easy chair and practicing mentally what he calls the seven Morrison keys. The mental side of golf represents 80% of the game, and he says the physical side 8% and the mechanical side 2%. In his book, Better Golf Without Practice, Morrison tells how he taught Lou Laird to break 90 for the first time with no actual practice whatsoever. Morrison said Laird sit in, sit, had Lair sit in an easy chair in his living room and relax while he demonstrated for him the correct swing and gave him a brief lecture on the Morrison keys. There it is in action again. It's like he's demonstrating to him so Lair can model what it looks like. And now he's going to get into the keys here. He was instructed to engage in no actual practice on the links, but instead spend five minutes each day relaxing in his easy chair, visualizing himself attending to the keys correctly. Morrison goes on to tell several days later with no physical preparation or whatever, Lair joined his regular foursome and amazed them by shooting nine holes in an even par, 36. The core of the Morrison system is, you must have a clear mental picture of the correct thing before you can do it successfully. Exactly. Morrison, by this method, enabled Paul Whiteman and many other celebrities to chop as much as 10 to 12 strokes off their scores. Johnny Bula, the well-known professional golfer, wrote an article several, several years ago in which he said that having a clear mental image of just where you wanted the ball to go and what you wanted it to do was more important than form in golf. Most of the pros, says Bula, have one or more serious flaws in their form, yet they manage to shoot good golf. It was Bula's theory that if you would picture the end result, see the ball going where you wanted it to go, and have the confidence to know that it was going to do what you wanted, your subconscious would take over and direct your muscles correctly. I have all this underlined because this is so true, and it, using the analogy of sports is very, very helpful for us to understand this because you can actually witness it happening firsthand. With these more complicated tasks, you, you don't really see, you can trace um, these things back, but it's much more easily, much more visible with like sports performance. If the, if the grip was wrong and your stance not in the best form, your subconscious would still take care of that by directing your muscles to do whatever was necessary to complete, to compensate for the error in form. The real secret of mental picturing. Successful men and women have since the beginning of time used mental pictures and rehearsal practice to achieve success. Napoleon, for example, practiced soldiering in his imagination for many years before he ever went on actual battlefield. Women, Webb and Morgan in their book, Making the Most of Your Life, tell us that the notes Napoleon made from his readings during these years of study filled, when printed, 400 pages. Wow. He imagined himself as a commander and drew maps of the island of Corsica, showing where he would place various defenses, making all his calculations with mathematical precision. So it's almost like he was playing these out on like a modern day um you know they have those game boards that people used to play before cell phones took over uh positioning all his soldiers and all of his units on the battlefield conrad hilton imagined himself operating a hotel long before he ever bought one when a boy he used to play that he was a hotel operator Henry J. Kaiser has said that each of his businesses business accomplishments was realized in his imagination before it appeared in actuality. It is no wonder that the art of mental picturing has the in the past sometimes been associated with magic. 
However, the new science of cybernetics gives us an insight into why mental picturing produces such amazing results and shows us that these results are not due to magic, but the natural, normal functioning of our minds and brains. Cybernetics regards the human brain, nervous system, and muscular system as a highly complex servo mechanism, an automatic goal-seeking machine which steers its way to a target or goal by the use of feedback, data, and stored information automatically correcting course when necessary. As stated earlier, this new concept does not mean that you are a machine, but that your physical brain and body functions as a machine which you operate. This automatic creative me mechanism within you can operate in only one way. It must have a target to shoot at. As Alex Morrison says, you must first clearly see a thing in your mind before you can do it. When you do see a thing clearly in your mind, your creative success mechanism within you takes over and does the job much better than you could do it by conscious effort or willpower. And that, again, my friends, is what I always say. That's the distinction. That's what Neville truly means when he says things like don't lift a finger. He's talking about the force, the willpower, the conscious effort. Anyways, instead of trying hard by conscious effort to do the thing by iron jawed willpower and all the while worrying and picturing to yourself all the things that are likely to go wrong, you simply relax the strain. Stop trying to do it by strain and effort. Picture to yourself the target you really want to hit and let your creative success mechanism take over. Thus, mental picturing the desired end result literally forces you to use positive thinking. You are not relieved thereafter after from effort and work, but your efforts are used to carry you forward towards your goal rather than futile mental conflict, which results when you want and try to do one thing, but picture yourself doing something else. Again, he's touching on that you know, when your imagination and your willpower in, are in opposition to each other, the willpower, the imagination will win out against the willpower. So what you do is you put them both so that they're both working in your favor. Finding your best self, the same creative mechanism within you can help you achieve your best possible self. If you will form a picture in your imagination of the self you want it to be and see yourself in the new role, aka modeling, aka embodying the state, that new viewpoint, as Frederick Dodson would say, This is a necessary condition to personality transformation, regardless of the method of therapy used. Somehow, before a person can change, he must see himself in a new role. Edward McGoldrick used this technique in helping alcoholics cross the bridge from old self to new self. Each day, he has his students close their eyes, relax the body as much as possible, and create a mental motion picture of themselves as they would like to be. In this mental motion picture, they see themselves as sober, responsible people. They see themselves actually enjoying life without liquor. This is not uh, the, not the only technique used by McGoldrick, but is one of the basic methods at Bridge House, which has a higher record to cure alcoholics than any other in the country. I myself have witnessed veritable miracles in personality transformation when an individual changes his self-image. However, today we're only beginning to glimpse the potential creative power which stems from human imagination and particularly our images concerning ourselves. Consider the implications, for example, in the following news release, which appeared a couple years ago under the Associated Press Dateline. Just imagine you're sane. San Francisco, some mental patients had uh, can improve their lot and perhaps shorten their stay in hospitals just by imagining that they are normal, two psychologists with the uh, veterans admin at Los Angeles reported. Uh, so they've got a couple doctors tried the idea on 45 men hospitalized at neur neuropsychiatrics. The patients first were given the usual personality test, then they were asked flatly to take the test a second time and answer the questions as they would if they were a typical, well-adjusted person on the outside. Three-fourths of them turned in improved test performances and some of the changes for the better were dramatic, the psychologist reported. In order for these patients to answer the questions as a typical, well-adjusted person would answer, they had to imagine how a typical, well-adjusted person would act. They had to imagine themselves in the role of a well-adjusted person, and this in itself was enough to cause them to begin acting like and feeling like a well-adjusted person. We can begin to see why the, uh, doc the late Dr. Albert Edward Wiggum called your mental picture of yourself the strongest force within you. Know the truth about yourself. The aim of self-image psychology is not to create a fictitious self, which is all-powerful, arrogant, egotistic, all-important. Such an image is as inappropriate as an unrealistic as the inferior self-image. Our aim is to find the real self and to bring our mental images of ourselves more in line with the objects they represent. 
However, it is common knowledge among psychologists that most of us underrate ourselves, shortchange ourselves, and sell ourselves short. Actually, there's no such thing as a superiority complex. People who seem to have one are actually suffering from feel feelings of inferiority. This is exactly what Alfred Adler talks about. And, you know, the book, The Courage to Be Disliked, I've talked about that book. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing book. It goes up there again with my top books of all time, really, because it's going again. It's that polarity. You want that that balance the the inflated superiority complex is really just going so far into inferiority that it, it has to ping pong and this is a a facade that is created out of the inferiority complex and um that you know they they go into depth in that in that book he maybe he'll cover it here but uh it's a fiction a cover-up to hide them from themselves and others their deep down feelings of inferiority and insecurity how can you know the truth about yourself? How can you make a true evaluation? It seems to me that here psychology must turn to religion. The scriptures tell us that God created man a little, little lower than the angels and gave him dominion. That God created man in his own image. And if we really believe in the all-wise, all-powerful, all-loving creator, we are in a position to draw some logical conclusions about which he has created, man. In the first place, such an all-wise and all-powerful creator would not turn out inferior products any more than a master painter would paint inferior canvases. Such a creator would not deliberately engineer his product to fail any more than a manufacturer would deliberately fail, uh, build failure into an automobile. The fundamentalists tell us that God's chief purpose and reason for living is to glorify God, or that man's chief purpose. And the humanists tell us that man's pur uh, purpose is to express himself fully. However, if we take the premise that God is loving a creator and has the same interest in his creation that an earthly father has in his children, then it seems to me the fundamentalists and the humanists are saying the same things. Bringing together science and spirituality, right? What brings more glory, pride, and satisfaction to a father than seeing his offspring do well, succeed, and express to the full their abilities and talents? Have you ever sat by the father of a football star during a game? Jesus expressed the same thought when he told us not to hide our light under a bushel, but to let our light shine so that your father may be glorified. I cannot believe that it brings any glory to God when his children go around with hangdog expressions, being miserable, afraid to lift their heads up and be somebody. As Dr. Leslie D. Weatherhead has said, if we have in our minds a picture of ourselves as fear-haunted and defeated nobodies, we must get rid of that picture at once and hold up our heads. That is a false picture, and the false must go. God sees us as men and women in whom and through whom he can do a great work. He sees us as already serene, confident, and cheerful. He sees us as not pathetic victims of life, but masters of the art of living, not wanting sympathy, but imparting help to others, and therefore thinking less and less of ourselves, and full, not of self-concern, but of love and laughter which, with a desire to serve. Let us look at the real selves which are in the making the most. Uh, the moment we believe in their existence. We must recognize the possibility of change and believe the self we are now in the process of becoming. The toll, That old sense of unworthiness and failure must go. It is false, and we are not to believe in what is false. Hold a picture of yourself long and steadily enough. So this is a practice exercise here. Hold a picture of yourself long and steadily enough in your mind's eye, and you will be drawn to it said Dr. Harry Emerson Fostick. Picture yourself vividly as defeated, and that alone will make victory impossible. Picture yourself vividly as winning, and that alone will contribute immeasurably to your success. Great living starts with a picture held in your imagination of what you would like to do or be. Your present self-image was built upon your own imagination pictures of yourself in the past, which grew out of interpretations and evaluations which you placed upon experience. Now where you are used to the same method to build an adequate self-image, you are to use the same method that you previously used to build an inadequate one. Set aside a period of 30 minutes each day where you can sit alone and be undisturbed. Relax and make yourself as comfortable as possible. Now close your eyes and exercise your imagination. Many people find they get better results if they imagine themselves sitting before a large motion picture screen and imagine that they are seeing a motion picture of themselves. The important thing is to make these pictures as vivid and detailed as possible. You want your me mental pictures to approximate actual experience as much as possible. The way to do this is pay attention to the small details, sights, sounds, objects in your imagined environment. 
One of my patients was using this exercise to overcome her fear of the dentist. She was unsuccessful until she began to notice the small details in her imagined picture. The smell of the antiseptic in the office, the feel of the leather on the chair arms, the sight of the dentist's well-manicured nails and his as his hands approached her mouth, etc. Details of the imagined environment are all important in this exercise because for all practical purposes, you are creating a practice experience. And if, if the imagination is vivid en enough and detailed enough, your imagination practice is equivalent to an actual experience insofar as your nervous system is concerned. The next important thing to remember is that during this 30 minutes, you see yourself acting and reacting appropriately, successfully, ideally. It doesn't matter how you acted yesterday. You do not need to try to have faith you will act in the ideal way tomorrow. Your nervous system will take care of that in time. If you continue to practice, see yourself acting, feeling, being as you want to be. Do not say to yourself, I'm going to act this way tomorrow. Just say to yourself, I'm going to imagine acting I'm going to imagine myself acting in this way now for 30 minutes today. Imagine how you would feel if you were already the sort of personality you wanted to be. If you have been shy and timid, see yourself moving among people with ease and poise and feeling good because of it. If you have been fearful and anxious in certain circumstances, see yourself acting calmly and deliberately, acting with confidence and courage and feeling expansive and confident because you are. I have all of this highlighted here because it's it's very important to dwell on the words being said here, to allow them to create those internal representations, those mental images in your mind so that you can begin to allow it to saturate your consciousness and see what that looks like so that you can then embody and model that. The exor this exercise builds new memories or stored data in your midbrain and central nervous system. It builds a new image of self. After practicing it for a time, you will be surprised to find yourself acting differently, more or less automatically and spontaneously without trying. There it is, without effort. This is as it should be. You do not need to take thought or try to make an effort now in order to feel ineffective or act inadequately. Your present inadequate feeling and doing is automatic and spontaneous. Because of the memories, real and imagined, you have built into your automatic mechanism, you will find it will work just as automatically upon positive thoughts and experiences as upon negative ones. And that concludes this chapter here. The, the um, last part of the chapter here, it says to key points to remember, you fill these in here, and then the case history list here some experience uh, out of your past that is explained by the principles given in this chapter. Um, and yeah, this, uh, you know, it really, again, engaging. If you guys want, just leave in the comments down below your notes or in a separate note file so that you can refer back to them. And that's what's going to, by doing this exercise, by really taking the time even if you don't want to dedicate 30 minutes, even just doing this for 10 minutes, even just doing it, just building up and allowing yourself to see yourself acting in this, like he says, how would you feel if you were the personality you want to be? Moving among people with ease and poise and feeling good because of it. Acting calmly and de deliberately with confidence and courage, feeling expansive and confident because you are. Really dwelling in that dwelling in that movie of the mind and playing that out is now how you are able to sit in the director's chair and direct that new movie, that new play, that new story that you are going to begin to embody simply by resting your attention there, by allowing that to dominate your awareness, by allowing your consciousness to be saturated with that, that imagery and that idea and that sense of being because the imagery, it's all connected. The sense of self is connected to the, the images, the words that you're telling yourself. That's why our tools, visualization, robotic affirming, scripting, these are valuable tools. And you could even write this out to yourself. Describe a scene to yourself. What is the scene that you're wanting to achieve? Is it going on that date? Is it going into that job interview? Is it um, you know, being effective in your career? Whatever it might be, you begin to write the scene out 
as if you were that personality that you were choosing to become, embodying that character now. So with that being said, guys, much love as always. Drop this down below with your comments, your notes, and um, hit me with a subscribe if you've not done so already. And I will see you guys in the next video. Next time we're going to be going over chapter four, which is to dehypnotize yourself from false beliefs. So I will see you in the next video.